The first thing I'd like to do is uh, say thanks uh, to Gordon Moore, who's hosting us here today. Um, Dr. Moore's been uh, an important part of uh, the Electrochemical Society for 59 years as a member, uh, and in, in important, the important part, the, uh, the author of, of Moore's Law, uh, one of the most influential uh, research strategies of, the, uh, of, of all time. And so, uh, so thank you. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. We um, uh, really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you uh, because of, of your long-term affiliation with uh, ECS and, uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, the contributions you've made to solid-state science and technology, which has been such an important component of what we do as an organization. Um, but before we start talking about Moore's Law or uh, some of the, the things that you've done uh, in terms of your scientific accomplishment, uh, I'd like to have you tell us about you, and so let's start by uh, going back to when you were a child, uh, your early days in California, uh, and uh, some of the things that uh, influenced you and began to lead you maybe to a career or an interest in science. Well, I was raised till I was 10 years old in a small farm community uh, near the coast of California. My father was a peace officer, a deputy sheriff, and finally chief deputy sheriff of the county. Uh, but the thing that really started my interest in science was when my neighbor got a chemistry set for Christmas, and I found the interesting things you could do with them. Mm -hmm. In those days, you had some pretty exciting chemicals. I think they're a lot tamer today. But my interest was really accentuated by my ability to make explosives. Starting out with simple things like gunpowder and... Uh, so how old were you when you were playing with explosives? <laughs> well, when my neighbor got the chemistry set, I was about 13. Okay. I had moved over the hill to the more populous part of the county by then, so a neighbor was close by. And I maintained a whole laboratory for several years and moved from gunpowder to nitroglycerin, various kinds of dynamites and so forth. Uh, and that really maintained my interest in science in general and particularly in chemistry. So as you got a little bit older, um and were in high school, uh, did, were, there, were there teachers or things that were sort of stoking your interest then? Uh, I was still interested in explosives after I got to high school. Uh, that part of chemistry I probably knew better than the chemistry instructor. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, I did enjoy the science program, the usual biology, chemistry, physics, and the math programs that went along with it. So I, I did have a reasonable education to get started. Mm -hmm. Which I assume launched you uh, uh, onto Berkeley, right, where you got an undergraduate degree? Right. And so uh, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, influences and, and things that may have happened at Berkeley that moved you along? Okay, I only went to Berkeley for my junior and senior year. I took two years at San Jose State uh, because I could stay at home and commute, mm -hmm. then moved to Berkeley for the last two years. And there I, I really got, I think, a very good undergraduate education in chemistry. You know, they had a lot of uh, very well-known and broadly respected professors. I had classes from people like Lynn Seaborg, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Joke, uh, all subsequent Nobel Prize winners. Mm -hmm. Not because they taught me, but because of things they learned otherwise. But uh, Berkeley was uh, really a, a very good step in my career. And from there I went to graduate school at Caltech. Right. Well, 
um, so you had some great influences at Berkeley, and, and now you're at Caltech. Um, and so who was there, and, and what happened there that uh, was really relevant and, again, helped you progress, open doors? I arrived at Caltech and had to look for a professor uh, to work under, interviewed several of them, and decided to work for Professor Richard Badger who was doing some interesting things with infrared spectroscopy. This intrigued me. It was the kind of experiments I thought I could do pretty well. And uh, it was relatively early in the days of molecular structure. Linus Pauling was chairman of the department. I had courses from him in the chemical bond and quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And generally, as a small school like Caltech was able to meet with these people as often as I wanted, which was generally not very often, mm -hmm. but enough to keep my research on track. I, yeah, I just, um, you, you threw out uh, a number of names, and I, I think this is, you know, uh, sort of a common uh, theme in, in these interviews that we do uh, for people like yourself where you, you can point to a number of uh, very significant influences, uh, usually uh, professors and, and, and you mentioned Linus uh, Pauling who um, uh, is the only person that has won I think both the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and the Nobel Peace Prize as well. Um, and I know there's an award named after him that uh, a few of our prominent members have won. So, you know, clearly you've had, uh, it was a, a very nice opportunity for you to uh, get things started with some really tremendous mentors. Yeah, well, Linus Pauling, as chairman of the department, was a pretty imposing figure. Mm -hmm. To the point where he could ask me my name and I'd be convinced I didn't know it. <laughs> Uh, he intimidated me. Really? In fact, I planned my final oral while he was out of the country so he wouldn't be on the committee. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you started to get interested in a certain uh, type of research and you had these uh, very uh, profound influences from uh, some great chemists. Uh, did that, how'd that uh, impact the first position that you took? Uh, I guess I want to talk about the, you know, the next step, uh, which is Applied Physics Laboratory. Yeah, well, finishing graduate school, uh, I w would like to have gotten a professorship someplace, but with a time when schools weren't really expanding, uh, there weren't any decent opportunities that I could see, so I decided to take a job in a research lab. Uh, Johns Hopkins was running the Applied Physics Laboratory for the Department of Defense. And they had a small research group in there that was doing basic research. And some of it was reasonably close to my thesis work. Mm -hmm. I had used infrared spectroscopy for studying the structure of molecules. I was quite familiar with the instruments. And I learned to do such things as blow glass, make gas handling mm -hmm. glass jungles. Uh, and these seemed like appropriate techniques to take to my first job, mm -hmm. where they also had some good infrared spectrometers and the ability to do things that I couldn't even have done as a grad student. So I joined this research group and uh, was doing research on uh, spectral lines and I started calculating the cost per word in the published papers. I wasn't sure how many people were reading them, was wondering if the government was getting its money's worth at $5 a word. So I decided maybe I ought to get to something more practical. Oh, I see. I was also interested in moving back to California. Uh, Maryland was pleasant for a couple of years, but it was different and all my relatives were in California. And the research group I was in was breaking up all of a sudden. Oh, okay. So I decided to join the breakup when looking for a job. And one place I interviewed actually was Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. 
Uh, they made me an offer, but they wanted me to do something like take Spectra and nuclear explosions, which was not a very attractive opportunity. Although, although it was something uh, connected to your youth, uh, explosions. <laughs> That's right. That was on a scale that was even was beyond my comprehension. How long were you at um, Applied Physics Lab? I joined there in September of 53 left in 56, so just short of three years. So you said no to Lawrence Livermore, but you got a call from William Shockley, is that yeah, what happened? Shockley had a contact and got to go through their file of people to whom they made offers and turned them down. And he thought he needed a chemist in his new operation, mm -hmm. but just getting set up at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was a chemist. Uh, he was an undergraduate at Caltech, so still thought Caltech grads were useful, mm -hmm. and made me an offer. He was setting up his lab within 10 miles of where I had grown up, so it was an attractive location. And the goal of making a silicon transistor that could be sold broadly was what he was setting out to do. So I was aiming at something more practical than I'd done previously. I was getting geographically where I wanted to be. So it worked out very well for me. So you said uh, Shockley was interested in, in, in hiring a chemist, bringing a chemist you know, into, into the fray. Uh, what was, how did that work? I mean, what, what was, why was that important? Uh, what what well, role were you filling? Shockley found that chemists were useful at Bell Labs thought he needed one. Uh, I remember Ray asking me a question about how I would remove copper contamination from the surface of silicon. Uh, at Bell Labs, the chemist he had, I think, used a cyanide solution to complex the copper and get it out. He was wondering if I could come up with something like that. And I thought I probably could. So he knew there were chemical problems. He was a physicist and didn't feel comfortable in that area. And I get a sense you, you knew that you could play an, an important role. They, they needed uh, the chemistry uh, to do what they were doing. Well, I thought it'd be an important role. I was more nearly looking at, I guess, a, a job that fit the description of what I thought I was looking for. What was it like at? Shockley's laboratory? Shockley's laboratory was a, an interesting startup. I think, as I remember, I was his 18th employee. So it really was a startup in a small building that was little more than a Quonset hut. Had a domed roof like a Quonset hut, although it had more substantial walls. And uh, cleanliness was not something that we really pursued with diligence in those days. So it was open to the elements. Uh, and it started out fine with our projects we were working on. But Shockley turned out to be a, a relatively poor administrator. Uh, he felt he had to compete with the people that worked for him. He had some peculiar ideas about managing the staff. You know, simple things like he thought he could post everybody's salary on the bulletin board so they could get a comparison of where they fit in the organization. Yeah. He was disabused of that idea, but he had a variety of other things. I think the one that eventually caused the most problem. One of the clerks had cut her hand on something on the door to the little office she occupied. Shockley didn't think this was an accident. He thought someone had done this maliciously. And he was going to find out who. And the way he was going to do this was to subject the entire staff to a lie detector test. Oh, jeez. <laughs> which he started out to do, got through the first few, and then the rest of us just kind of said, no, Bill. 
it turns out uh, the metallurgist he had hired took this object that had cut the clerk's hand, looked at it under the microscope, and determined what it was was the metal part on one of these glass-headed pins where the glass head had broken off. And she, uh, somebody had stuck something on the door there, mm -hmm. and she cut her hand on that. Anyhow, this, this was an example of Shockley's way of managing. So uh, Arnold Beckman, which was a sort of the financing mm -hmm. for Shockley, came up and gave a talk to the staff. And after the talk, Shockley got up and told Arnold that if he didn't like the way the thing was running, Shockley could go someplace else and take the group and make money and get money to run an operation. But well, we use this as a, a point to call Beckman and say, there's no way the rest of us would go with Shockley. If he leaves, he leaves. Uh, I was the one that got the privilege of making that phone call. Wow. And Beckman says, things aren't going so well up there, are they? And I said, no, they're a problem. So he came up and arranged to get together with a group of us for dinner. We discussed the problems. In fact, we had a series of these dinner meetings where we were looking for a solution. We were proposing moving Shockley into a professorship and keeping him as a consultant because his physical intuition was great. It was his management skills that were bothering us. And uh, Arnold Beckman was going along with that. And then he met up with some of the of Shockley's previous colleagues from Bell Laboratories. And he told him that would just ruin Shockley's career. He couldn't do it. So Beckman and told the group of us that Shockley was the boss. We had to stay with that. Well, we learned that a group of young graduates couldn't push a new Nobel Prize winner aside very easily. So we decided we had burned our bridges so badly by that time that we had to leave. Mm. And we were going to run off and look for jobs individually. But one of the group wrote a letter to his father's stockbroker saying, there's a group of us here who like working together. Is there a company who would like to hire the whole group? And that partner in the brokerage firm and a young Harvard MBA said, uh, wait a minute, we'll come out. They came out from New York and met with the group. And after a meeting, they said, what you really ought to do is set up your own company and we will find funding for you. So we thought, okay, that way we don't have to sell our houses and move or you stay where we are. So we set them off doing it. And uh, we started off by going down the Wall Street Journal's table of the New York Stock Exchange companies and identifying everyone we thought might like to start a semiconductor operation. And these people from New York visited or contacted all 35 firms that we had identified, none of whom even interviewed the group. They all turned it down as something that wouldn't fit into their company. But these... Why? So was it... Too much risk? Uh, they didn't see the opportunity? It's so different. What do they do with the employees they have already? Yeah. Oh. Why, would, why could you do something special for this group right. without doing something for somebody else? Anyhow, these two people from Hayden Stone, which was the brokerage firm that took over, met up with Sherman Fairchild in New York quite by accident, as I understand it. Sherman Fairchild loved technology. He had set up an airplane company and a camera company to do aerial photography, for example. And he was intrigued, and he introduced them to the chairman of Fairchild Camera and Instrument Corporation. 
and uh, they decided to take a look at it. So that was how we initially got set up with Fairchild Cameron Instrument, and that was the founding of Fairchild Semiconductor. Mm -hmm. The eight of us who had left Shockley were the core team there. It's a famous story. They, they, this, it's described as the, the traitorous eight, and yet it sounds like you all were running for your, <laughs> for your lives from a, uh, an organization that just really was uh, a hardship for those that were employed yeah, there. The, the name traitorous eight, which I think came from Shockley's wife, That's, yeah. stuck. <laughs> Where did Robert Noyce fit into the Traitorous Eight? Uh, Bob Noyce joined the seven of us that initially had started the dinners with Shockley. Uh, he took a little convincing, but uh, you know, he was clearly the most senior of the members of the group, and having him as part of it was important. Interesting on noise, he arrived at Shockley on Friday and I had arrived the following Monday. I've been chasing behind him ever since. Connections, it's uh, right place at right time, isn't that right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so now, Sherman Fair, Fairchild uh, provides the backing for Fairchild Semiconductor, which becomes one of the seminal companies in the development of Silicon Valley. So can you talk a little bit about how that happened, what was going on? Uh, Fairchild set up to accomplish the job that Shockley had initially set up to do, make commercial double diffuse silicon transistors. Mm -hmm. Now Shockley, before we left, had actually changed his objective. He had abandoned the transistor decided he was going to make four-layer diodes, another device he had invented. I think his reasoning was that Texas Instruments was already producing silicon transistors, and he didn't want to be the second one. But uh, he was actually pointed in the right direction, although he didn't continue to pursue it. At Fairchild, we decided to take on the objective that he had abandoned and go after the silicon transistor. And uh, we had the unique experience of being able to start over with a good idea. At Shockley, we had had to kludge a bunch of research equipment and, and the furnaces weren't right. Uh, but starting new at Fairchild, we knew pretty well what we wanted. So we bought the equipment, or designed the equipment to do the job. Uh, we had a few problems we had to solve to make the transistor, but about a month, excuse me, about a year after we founded Fairchild Semiconductor, we actually were able to deliver our first transistors. And uh, I just, would like to have you just tell us a little bit more. It's a word, and, and so as a result of that, what happened? Fairchild got off on the right technology. The idea of the double diffusion was appropriate. Uh, we determined that you could get by with a single metal for both the N-type and P-type silicon for contacts, which was a big surprise and a giant leap forward. Uh, we adopted photolithography for patterning, which had been done in printed circuit boards, but hadn't been done for transistors before that. Anyhow, we got the technology pointed in the right direction. And then shortly after we got our first transistors out, one of the original group, Jean Herny, came up with the idea of a planar transistor that left the silicon oxide on over where the junctions came to the surface, the most sensitive part of the transistors, and one that was causing us all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. It's an area of high electric field that uh, attracts dust particles, for example, which bothered the breakdown voltage of the transistors. The planar transistor with this oxide covering 
which uh, people had thought was not a bad idea before, uh, worked out fine. Uh, Jean's, her, her knee's contribution mm -hmm. really was a major step in the evolution of the technology. And more than that was the path for the successful integrated circuit. So Fairchild was lucky at getting pointed in the right technological direction. And that path you're talking about, obviously, is the path that led to your thinking, you know, about Moore's Law. Uh, you were with Fairchild until 1968, as I understand it, but you, again, your, your own thinking about it uh, uh, and the idea of Moore's Law is, is, is something that uh, began uh, a few years earlier. And I just want to make a connection to uh, ECS uh, from your biography. Uh, in 1964, and I'll, I'll read uh, an excerpt from that. In prior publications, Moore had laid out his ideas. Now it was time to convey his insights to the technical community as compelling as he could and to convince others about the future of electronics. Preaching his message would take practice, hence a low-key start on home turf with a talk on December 2nd, 1964 to a local section of the Electrochemical Society on the San Francisco Peninsula. So you began to see the potential and, and uh, get your thinking around uh, the possibility of, of Moore's Law. Uh, could you describe that a little bit more, what was going on? Yeah. Well, uh, Fairchild introduced the first integrated circuits using the planar technology in 1961. These were simple circuits using a few transistors and resistors. But the obvious evolution path was to put more and more circuitry in a given chip as the technology improved to the point where we could. So we went from a few transistors to a few more and I could see that we were increasing the complexity and I didn't know how far this was going to go. But I started looking at this as a major trend. In the 1964 session of the Electrochemical Society locally, I think I gave my first public exposure of the direction my thinking was going. What was the response? This was uh, uh, just very new uh, and based on fairly recent uh, research. Uh, I don't remember any response. <laughs> uh, this was an idea that was fairly new. And uh, I expanded it when Electronics Magazine asked me to predict what was going to happen in the next 10 years for their 35th anniversary edition. Mm -hmm. So I started looking in more detail and writing this up. And uh, the article that showed it that came out in early 1965. So I would have been writing it just about the time I was giving the talk at the Electrochemical Society. Mm -hmm. And what I did was look at what had happened in the first few years of the integrated circuit and saw what we were doing in the laboratory and decided we were going kind of 4, 8, 16, mm -hmm. 32, and I could see something around 60 components. So I said, oh, it's doubling every year. So I took a piece of semi-log paper and extrapolated what had happened so far for 10 years and came up with the idea that the complexity on a chip measured by the number of components could grow from about 60 to about 60,000, a thousand-fold increase in the next decade. Now this was an idea just to qualitatively get across the picture that this was going to make electronics a lot cheaper. I had no idea it was going to be anywhere near quantitative correct, just a trend. And it turned out to be surprisingly accurate. Well, I would say so. Uh, that's, I think, what makes it so profound. Um, 
so the, they celebrate the uh, 50th anniversary of the integrated circuit in 2015, I believe. That's uh, and and so uh, so it lasted for 50 years. I, you know, it just it seems that for you to have that sort of vision uh, is really is really um, amazing. Well, uh, one thing I decided not to make another prediction. <laughs> I'd quit while I was ahead. <laughs> See, I've heard like prognosticators say uh, that you're supposed to make a lot of predictions, so at least a, a few of them, you know, turn out to be right. <laughs> well, good for you. You just stuck to the one. Um, so, with with this in mind, I uh, want to move to Intel. Uh, so now you're going to leave uh, Bob Noyce and and uh, with uh, Moore's Law in in mind, uh, create Intel and. So tell us about uh, 1968, now you're moving on. Okay, well Fairchild became quite successful. It grew to something like $150 million annual revenue and uh, several tens of thousands of employees worldwide. But Fairchild management at the top had some problems. Fairchild Semiconductor had become a division of Fairchild Cameron Instrument mm -hmm. by the original deal that was put in place. And Fairchild fired its chairman of the board, promoted the then president, the chairman, and CEO, and six months later fired him. And they were trying to run the company with a three-man committee of the board of directors who had no real involvement with any of the divisions. Now, Bob Noyce was the logical internal candidate, and they were clearly going to pass him by. So he got unhappy and thought he ought to leave, and approached me with the possibility of leaving, and my first reaction was, no, I had the best job in the industry. A few months later, he came back and said, not did I want to leave and do something, but he said he was going to leave. And I decided that if he left, things would change fairly dramatically. It would be new management brought in from outside. My position wouldn't be very stable. And there was an opportunity that reared its head, which doesn't happen very often to start in a new direction. So I said, okay, I'll join you. The two of us decided to set up Intel. Now, we had been sufficiently successful at Fairchild that uh, we didn't have any trouble raising money. Also, it was a time when venture capital was very available. Yeah. So we called Arthur Rock, the person who had been the young MBA at Hayden Stone and said we wanted to set up a new company and we had to raise some money. Would you take it on? He said, sure. So he sold half the company in an afternoon. Uh, and it was so easy. My wife, Betty, was getting phone calls at home from people who wanted to participate. And anyhow, we raised all the money we thought we needed, which kind of looks pretty puny in this day and age. And we started out with $5 million and went on to uh, start developing the technology, principally aimed at semiconductor memory initially, but with the idea that very complex integrated circuits were a potential new business. The semiconductor industry by that time had kind of decided that a large assembly plant in Southeast Asia was what was important. Yeah. Packaging was more expensive than the silicon itself. Uh, we thought we could change the leverage back by putting much more of the stuff into the silicon rather than into the packaging. And uh, from my point of view, the startup of Intel went reasonably smoothly. 
Uh, we hit our goals. We decided we had to be at least 25 million in revenue in five years to be viable. Uh, we were 63 million in five years. Now, my recollection is completely different than my colleague Andy Grove's recommend, uh, recollection. He says it was the most trying time of his life. He thought we were going to go bankrupt every <laughs> week. And I think it's a difference in our personality. Andy and I work very well together. Uh, so uh, just to you know, make a comment, of course, uh, Andy Grove, uh, along with Bruce Deal, is one of the uh, uh, authors of, of uh, a seminal paper in, in one of our journals and uh, obviously contributed to the scientific body of knowledge and then was uh, one of the very influential people in the growth and development of Intel. Uh, wh when did Andy uh, join the team, come into the fray? Uh, I hired Andy right out of graduate school, of his graduate school at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was at Fairchild in 1963. Mm -hmm. And he very rapidly became head of a department and then uh, assistant director of R&D. I was director of R&D. And when I told him I was leaving to set up Intel, his immediate response was he wanted to come along. And he did. Uh, Andy initially, uh, I thought, would be something like become head of R&D at Intel when we had R&D. But Andy was somebody who went through a variety of uh, careers along the way. And uh, he had a chance in the beginning of Intel to see how organizations worked. Mm -hmm. He was in charge of all operations and was intrigued by the manufacturing, the need to do something repeatedly and well all the time. So he took a step up looking at how organizations work, later became a management guru, right. very important in the development of Intel. Uh, you know, I may have helped with the ideas, but he implemented them. Well, I, uh, you, you referenced uh, him as a, uh, a management guru. Um, I went to graduate school to get an MBA in the 80s, and he was, uh, that was one of the, uh, the body of knowledge he began to create around his management tactics and philosophies was a really a big uh, component of some of the things we studied at that time. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yep. Uh, is there anybody else uh, that's you contributed in a very significant way, the early days that you'd like to mention, comment about? Well, uh, <coughs> uh, w one important contribution was the microprocessor. Uh, the knowledge in the industry generally was someday we'll put a computer on a chip but that one was way in the future. And Intel had made these first memory chips. In particular, we had a 1024-bit static memory out of a couple of thousand transistors. And we had an engineer who had significant systems experience. And we were trying to solve a problem. Beyond memory, we were going to make chips for a Japanese calculator company. And they had laid out some 13 complex chips they wanted us to make for their family of calculators. And we were a little company. We couldn't tackle 13 chips if we had to. But he looked at these and he says, you know, with a general purpose computer architecture, I could do all of these calculators. And he don't think the chip would be much more complex than the memory chips we're making. And that was a very attractive idea. This was Ted Hoff. And uh, we convinced the Japanese company to abandon their 13 chips and uh, sign on to our way of doing it. So we set out to make a custom computer chip 
for the Japanese calculator company. And uh, we were a little slow getting started, but we delivered the first ones in early 1971. Mm -hmm. I remember that in 1971 because I had to argue with TI about who delivered the first microprocessors. And anyhow, we, uh, he made this, uh, we got a team together to develop this chip. Uh, Ted Hoff saw its broad implications and it could be a traffic light controller, and it can run elevators, he had a whole variety of control functions. And this was the kind of thing we were looking for, a complex chip that could be used in large volume so we could take advantage of what semiconductor technology does well. So I was excited about it, and we proceeded to go ahead and make them. But the Japanese company uh, was in a cost bind, so they wanted us to lower the price. And we said, well, the only way we can lower the price is if we increase the volume. And they said, okay, but not for calculators. So we got a license to sell the chip for anything except calculator applications. And six months later, they came around and said they still needed a lower price. And they were kind of going bankrupt, so we bought the design back from them. And then we had uh, complete flexibility on it. And that was the origin of the microprocessor. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, that was the first of a series where they got more complex, higher performance, lower power, all the things you see today. It's been a continual evolution right. for the last 40 years. I want to uh, ask you, since you mentioned Texas Instruments, uh, another one of the uh, uh, significant contributors and, and a person who's been involved in ECS, or lecturers and publishing, Jack Kilby. Oh, yeah. And where, where does Jack Kilby fit into all of this? Uh, Jack joined Texas Instruments about the time people were looking for ways of making things smaller for the military. And he was evidently the, one of the few people who didn't have vacation by the time uh, he got to work there. You know, he just had joined. <laughs> Tech TI kind of shut down every uh, August. Uh -huh. And Jack started fiddling around and he clued together a little circuit using all semiconductor components, resistors and so forth. It was really a laboratory kludge, but it showed you could do the whole circuit with semiconductors. And that was his major contribution. Noyce was the one that thought how extending the planar transistor could make something that was practical to manufacture. So the two of them are generally considered the joint inventors of the integrated circuit. Their contributions are quite different. Noyce would have shared the Nobel Prize if he had lived that year. Oh, okay. Uh, I, one of the members of the Nobel Committee told me he really screwed things up the year he died. They were going to award him <laughs> that year. Uh, but uh, they postponed it and got killed me a little later. I got the consolation prize of being invited to the ceremony. Well, uh, you know, it's now interesting. I want to start moving it forward. Um, uh, there's so much happening. Uh, computers' uh, power and the computers themselves are getting smaller and smaller. I mean, you've taken us to the point where I'm sitting here with a computer in my pocket. <laughs> What, what drove you all those years? I mean, there was so much progress. Obviously, that was exciting, but um, was it uh, new discoveries, the innovation? Uh, what, what, what drove you? What kept you in the hunt to, to, well, do, to you, make this you, happen? You know the title of Andy's last book, Only the Paranoid Survive. <laughs> so you remain paranoid oh, <laughs> that yeah, you had to keep uh, new innovations, otherwise you don't survive? There's always something nipping at you, somebody nipping at your heel. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Intel continues to make huge investments in technology mm -hmm. because that's a, it's, it's a unique situation. By making things smaller, they get faster, more reliable. You can use lower power. Everything gets better simultaneously, except they get harder to do. Mm -hmm. So there's a real advantage to continue to push the technology mm -hmm. as fast as you can. And so I, you probably get this question a lot. Um, 
so where, where do you think we can go from here? We're running out of gas. <laughs> uh, the fact that materials are made of atoms is showing up as a significant limitation. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, Stephen Hawking was in Silicon Valley of several years ago, and one of the questions in the audience is, what do you consider the ultimate limit on microelectronics? And uh, you know his usual slow word or letter by letter thing he constructed, the finite velocity of light and the atomic nature of matter. Mm -hmm. Stephen Hawking was pretty much correct. On a chip today, the signal uh, is limited to how long it takes to get from one side to the other by the velocity of light. And we're approaching layers that are only a few atoms thick where materials stop behaving like the bulk material. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty near the Hawking limits. So that makes me think of uh, something we wanted to you know, ask you about, um, scientific advancement in general. Um, so, uh, so much has changed. Uh, I, I've mentioned in our discussion uh, contributions from, your, your, I mean, yourself uh, at, at, at meetings and in publications, Andy Grove, Jack Kilby, uh, people who have uh, shared and exchanged information through professional societies like the Electrochemical Society. And now we're able to do that so much better um, with digital information, with search and discovery tools, with um, the really the, the globalization that is the connecting communications that we have. What can you, I don't know, just share with some of your thoughts of how you think that's going to advance science and innovation? Uh, certainly, it, it can eliminate a lot of time delays. You know, publication delays used to run years. Right. And now we have some places like PLOS where publication isn't delayed at all. Mm -hmm. I think this has to accelerate progress. On the other hand, the problems are getting increasingly complex. Mm -hmm. So it may not seem to the person who's doing it like things are moving more rapidly. But the things we do today just couldn't have been done without all of the assets we have today. That's an interesting comment. So we have to run twice as fast uh, to, to stay on the same pace we have in, in the past that may be, may be possible. Um, you mentioned PLOS. Uh, I think it uh, be, we'd all appreciate hearing a little bit about you know, what, what you're doing. PLOS is, is one of the organizations that your foundation has funded. And, and, uh, so I'd like to know a little bit more about your, your interests now and why um, you would have uh, funded PLOS, what, what they do that's important. <laughs> Uh, PLOS is one of the things our foundation did that I'm proud of. Uh, we had a person running our science program who understood the problems of publication, and he drove the program. It sounded interesting to me. I don't approve programs typically for the foundation. And uh, we made a contribution to get it started and off the ground. And it really has caught hold. Mm -hmm. And I think is a prototype of the way publication is going to continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think it, it set a phenomenal example as a success story. We're talking about the public library of science. I should um, to make sure that, that that's clear. And, um, and that they've become uh, a a mega journal, if you will, of uh, multiple scientific disciplines uh, that's uh, uh, under an open access or freely available uh, platform so that the information can be shared without uh, subscription obstacles. And, and it's a phenomenal success and uh, it enables an exchange of science, uh, the likes of which we haven't had before because of the, the subscription-based model. So I think that was a great seed to plant. Yeah, it was really one of our big successes. You know, as we're getting to a close on this, um, you know, I've, I've asked a lot of questions uh, and you've, you know, shared some incredible stories about um, 
the whole evolution of the organizations that you've worked in, but more importantly, the semiconductor technology advancement that we all benefit from. I mean, clearly, you're one of the, if not the most influential people of the last century. Um, anything anything uh, you'd like to share, just you know, your uh, thoughts about anything at all? What's, what's gonna be the next century? Should, we, should I just skip this question and say thank you very much? <laughs> Well, there are a lot of things I don't understand. Uh, you know, if we are reaching toward the limit to what we can do with silicon, uh, is there a next thing? And I read about things like quantum computing, and I don't understand how that becomes a general purpose computer. And maybe for some very special problems, it's a way to go. But uh, it's not going to be a replacement for the computer in your phone, in my opinion. Uh, I think we kind of exhaust our computing capability uh, pretty soon. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can string a lot of them together. And that's the way the supercomputers of today are being made already. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes a software problem to do complex calculation. Mm -hmm. But I don't see an alternative to the general technology that's developed around silicon. Mm -hmm. Now, it may not be silicon. Maybe we'll use indium antimonide or something to get higher mobility devices. But it's not just a silicon technology. It's a technology for building microstructures of various materials. Very complex in the way it can be implemented, mm -hmm. but uh, general purpose. And you see it being ex extended into medical devices, a variety of other things, and that will continue to be the case. Mm -hmm. You know, you said something that um, tripped a thought that I had. Uh, it was only, I don't know, several months ago that I was speaking to some people at uh, IBM T.J. Watson Research Center, uh -huh. which has also been a major contributor in this area. And, you know, they, they talk about a vision of having um, a computer that has all the knowledge ever <laughs> that, that, that has been shared by mankind. And, um, and to have that in one place, you mentioned the the connected uh, computers uh, imagine the the potential to be able to solve problems with uh, with with all that knowledge in one place, and that's that's what you've enabled uh, the, the the speed and the capacity that uh, where we they can build something like that, or we have the potential. So uh, it's really just to even think about that possibility is, is quite something. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They have a vision. Well, I want to uh, thank you uh, for sharing your story. Uh, it's, as I said earlier, uh, not only an incredible story, but the influence that you've had on, on all of us. And, and uh, uh, we've so much benefit from your work, your thinking, your vision. Uh, I want to thank you for sharing it with, with us today. Okay, well, thank you.